Judy, you're okay? Live Can we YouTube. stop sharing, Judy? You're okay? You yeah. can stop sharing your slides. And that would be great. Judy, you're okay. live. Can we YouTube. stop sharing, Judy? I should stop sharing? Okay. Yeah, because I'm going to make an introduction first. Then I'll, I'll bring you back. Great. great. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. And then I'm going to give the countdown. Excellent. Thank you, Ignacio. You're very welcome, Doctor. Ali, that's... Going live in five, four, three, two. Our webinar has started. Ignacio, I think we lost the volume. We can hear you, Dr. Morcos. You were able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the monthly University of Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Symposium on the third. Thursday of every month. Uh, this is, believe it or not, session 41. Today on December 16, uh, I'll introduce my uh, wonderful speakers uh, at the end of this brief introduction. Um, this is uh, the journey we've been through. You can see we are at the end of the year here and we're still uh, trying to figure out if we change the format for 2022, but we certainly will continue to go strong and uh, we will I will let you know what the new format and the schedule is for 2022. We're waiting for inspiration over the holiday season to see if we continue exactly as is or if we we will change the format in a in a different way. Uh, as every month uh, our uh, skull base cerebrovascular fellow David Altschuler will join the panel as well as our PG3 Eva Wu. Uh, to show a couple of cases for panel discussion. Um, I'm Jacques Morcos, uh, the co-chair and uh, of the department here, and director of vascular and skull base. Uh, uh, we have with us today my partner, Carolina Benjamin, co-director of the course. By now, you know all my partners who have been instrumental in putting these courses together, Carolina, Mike Ivan, and Bobby Stark. Uh, I know that many of you always attend them so you probably you'll find it redundant that I introduce people every time but you know we always have new people who join us and thank you for joining us uh, every month uh, uh, as you know we were doing pediatric uh, sessions as well my, my not we our partners in pediatrics on Mondays they will come back later the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium that Mike Ivan puts together the first Wednesday of every month. Again, encourage you, if you don't know it, to join us. It's a fantastic series of speakers, as you can see from the last one in October. Many thanks for the team here at the University of Miami that makes uh, these Zumposia uh, uh, possible, and particularly Ignacio Escalona, who runs all the technical aspects of these things. These are the various links that uh, gets you, get you to our website where you can actually watch all the previous uh, 
sessions. They're all recorded. They're all on our YouTube channel. It's actually quite a library now of spectacular series of lectures by speakers from all over the world, not just for this symposium, but also for the Wednesday symposium and the pediatric symposium and so forth. Twitter account, uh, Instagram accounts, feel free to reach out. You know the format of this symposium. Uh, I always, we always have four speakers, 20 minutes each. And the most important part is a Q&A at the end. So please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will be sure uh, to uh, address them. Uh, and now again, uh, a brief introduction of tonight's speakers in the order in which they will speak. It is my uh, immense pleasure to welcome again uh, Judy Wang, who is Professor and Vice Chair and Program Director, as well as Pro uh, Director of Cerebrovascular, Co-Director of Cranioplasty, Chiari and Trigeminal Neuralgia Programs and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And also she is a member of our a spectacular board of neurosurgery. And Judy, of course, is a world expert in cerebrovascular particularly, and Judy is wonderful to have her tonight. Second is who I call a younger brother to me and who used to be my resident many moons ago and has gone on to be a spectacular star, uh, Muhammad Ali Aziz Sultan. Most of us know him as Ali, is associate professor and very soon, Professor of Neurosurgery and Radiology at the Brigham in Boston. He's a Chief of Vascular and Endovascular, Co-Director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center. And, uh, and Ali and I go back a long way and it's uh, any excuse I have to invite him so I can see his lovely face, I do it. And of course, to listen to his very thoughtful uh, uh, remarks that he usually has about any topic that he tackles. Third, uh, Clemens Shermer, unfortunately, his flight had changed, so he cannot be with us in person, but he was kind enough to send me a pre-recorded 20-minute uh, presentation. And uh, Clemens is currently the chair of the CV section. He is director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center of the large Geisinger Health System in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, I know that his talk will be spectacular. I've already listened to it myself. Last but not least, uh, everybody know her as Stav, but I don't know why people perhaps have a speech impediment or something, but she has a lovely name and her name is Greek and is Stavropoula Jumakaris. He, she's professor of neurosurgery Director of Endovascular and Cerebrovascular Fellowship. She is Associate Program Director at Jefferson with, uh, with my good, good friend there. And she's in Philly, Pennsylvania, and always gives fantastic and very thoughtful uh, uh, presentations. So you can see a fantastic panel tonight. And uh, I'd like to wish everybody Happy holidays, any holiday that you celebrate, whether it's uh, Christmas or Kwanzaa or, of course, Happy New Year. And I will see you all in 2022. And now I invite Judy to share her screen, unmute the microphone and start her presentation. Thank you very much for that amazing um, introduction. Uh, it really is quite um, an honor to be among the who's who in uh, this symposia series and uh, to be joined by such amazing colleagues uh, today. So I have the pleasure of starting off um, the talk uh, with uh, what have we learned about AVM treatment after Aruba? And I hope that um, you can all see my screen, right? It, it's on the navigation mode, Judy. Navigation. It's not on the presentation. It's not on presentation. Hmm. If it's easier, for, we might see your notes if you keep it like that, which, which we, if you don't mind, we have it's just wrong. small, it's too small. I'm sorry, sorry, let me share the correct screen. Have this all set up for me. It's... Ignacio, you want her to click on that monitor next no. to the minus sign? 
I did that already. So oh, you did? We, yeah, so... But share your screen. We don't see your slide. Yeah, okay. No. So we cannot see your screen, doctor. You can't see the screen? Okay, sorry. No. Okay. We think that after all this time... Um, we're not doing enough Zooms, Judy. You know, that's a problem. <laughs> How about now? Yes, now go to the presentation mode. Okay. You see the present, it's not the slideshow, yes. right? The, it looks like you have one, yeah, close that. You see the slideshow thing? Close it. Yeah, I did. Now reopen it on the bottom. You can you close it again and reopen it. It looks like you have a that happens when you have more than one open. Press that one. Yeah, it's Press like frozen. F5. So. Yeah, yes, close it. Close it and, and reopen it. Open the PowerPoint again okay. and reopen it. Okay, sorry. No problem. Oh, edit it out. No problems. So the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Oh, I'm losing my time here. Don't worry, I'm not counting it against you. <laughs> Don't. I'll take it Why from is this Ali. One here. So uh, file. So do you see? You don't see the screen, right? No, we you're not sharing yet. Anything. No, you're not sharing right now. So should I open yeah. the... Yeah, if you if you have the presentation open, go back to Zoom and put share. But it's, uh, but it's opening in the wrong format. That's the thing. So I have... Well, let me get display settings. Swap. So I just did the swap thing again. Share. Yeah, but we, we, we cannot see it. Yeah, why don't why don't so uh... you, you're not sharing the screen now? You're sharing the screen, okay? Sorry, yes. so is this go to, the yeah, go to display screen? settings again? Display go settings and swap at the top, Judy, where it says display settings. If you go to it and then do swap, yeah, I don't have that. Just well, I mean, we can see it if it's okay, we can see it, it's a little a little smaller, but we can see it and we can see the <laughs> just so that you know, we can see two. Ah, now we, we see that. Do you what see happened? the whole screen? Yeah, we do. I think no. I think that's the that's the desktop. It's not the right format. No, it's the desktop. Oh, it's your desktop. We're seeing a swimming pool yeah. with some lovely vacation. Yeah, home. yeah, that's not the right thing. So that's why. Uh, how did I mess it up before? So I have the file open. Okay, and it's and you are seeing my share screen or no? No, we're seeing your desktop. The 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 swimming pool thing. How, uh, Ignacio, how can she go back to that? Yeah, how come I can't get the media I, controls? Um, let's see what I can do here. Stop sharing your screen. Let's, so let's, my, stop, let's, let's start by there. Stop sharing. Yep, let me try to get to the meeting controls. I think that's my Zoom window is not good. Yeah, okay, I, I closed you out. Now, but, open the power. Close everything that you have in your desktop. Everything, except Zoom. If it doesn't work this time, I can switch speakers if you want. Yes. And Judy, you can work. Go ahead and switch. Yes, this is... You know, let's, let's do that, if you don't mind. Switch. I'll yeah. ask Ali, would you want to go? Sure. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for... The kind invitation. Uh, Judy, you want to chat with Ignacio maybe on yes. the thing? And, and sure. see? Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, very yes. good. Ali. Great. Okay. Uh, so always a, a pleasure to see my mentor uh, and always uh, good to see Judy and, and Stavros and uh, really an honor to be here in my old home. Um, I, I went from Miami to uh, one of the leading institutions in, in, in the world, a place where Harvey Cushing <laughs> walked 
the halls and so forth. Um, and I got there because I was my mentorship. The, the people that trained me were the, the, the biggest hearted people uh, in, in neurosurgery. Um, Roberto Harros, uh, Spetzler, and, and, and Jacques Morcos, um, as, as cute as he is. Uh, uh, I was at a stage where we were caught uh, between this battle of endovascular and open vascular and, and uh, a number of us were, were, were caught in this. And, and I thought it was interesting to learn from both and try to combine the two different disciplines in whichever way that uh, we could. Um, and with that, I found a little niche for myself um, and, and uh, came to Boston, developed ORs, talked about different techniques that I had learned from Dr. Morcos and, and, and Dr. Harros and so forth, and, and really started to develop a group and a network of wonderful people that, that helped me. That's just a small part of my identity. Um, the biggest part of my identity is this, I'm, 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 I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, I was a child that was born there and raised there. Um, and, and this is one of the first few paintings uh, I, I, I had made, and this was in Germany. Um, it's, it's after uh, the 40 year war started. Um, and and it's, um, it's, it, it, it's something that keeps repeating itself, <laughs> a small, beautiful country in constant conflict with superpowers, the English, the Russians, us. Uh, that's me uh, the day before we escaped in the back of a Toyota pickup truck. Um, made it eventually from Afghanistan to Pakistan to Germany, the whole refugee thing, completely disorganized upbringing, parents working multiple jobs. Um, I really started to identify who I was by mentorship from these two, uh, Roberto Harros and Jock Morcos, who took me under my their wing and gave me structure, direction, uh, unwavering love, uh, and it built who I am now. Um, gave me confidence that I never had um, growing up, and uh, it was one of the best programs in the world. I'm, I'm so proud of that program and where it came from. As soon as residency finished, I, I went back to this yearning thing in my heart and that was going back to Afghanistan that was still in conflict. Um, and I went around uh, the country and toured different places just without <laughs> telling anybody. My aunt was the minister of health at the time and, and took me to this hospital and that hospital and the glass bridge and all of those things. But these hospitals were empty. Uh, so I decided to go on my own and to some county hospital and actually found the people <laughs> that I wanted to find, not the politicians. Um, and I found this one guy there um, who I didn't even know if they were neurosurgeons. I just said, I want to come here and help out. I had going through some tough times and I was trying to rediscover who I am. And uh, we started working together. Uh, and uh, over years, I would go back, get instruments from here, take them there. And, and they were very, very good. <laughs> There's actually 74 neurosurgeons in Afghanistan. And slowly over the years, he started building a residency program. Um, this is uh, one of the young men who's pre presenting in the ER. He actually lived in the hospital. He was a resident. He was presenting this epidural hematoma on a young 16-year-old boy who had to, his brother, that's his nurse, his brother, who's 18, brought him to the hospital, put him in a cab, took him across town. They gouged him for three months of salary to get a CAT scan. The cat had to go to Pakistan, just took the films and brought him back because he was herniating. Uh, we operated on them. They operated on him with 
<laughs> drill and so forth and he and he lived and his brother stood by him his bedside day and night taking care of him the program over the years built and more and more residents were being trained around the country uh, it's all this man in the middle that that did that and within time Did you write that, Mecca? people came to the house where i was staying with different problems that i couldn't help of masking him, where does it hurt? Lunch meeting? <laughs> and and it, with, whether, she, whether she'd give me a kiss. Um, everybody loves their children like we do, right? It, 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 they're not any different. They don't feel any different than you and I do about our loved ones. So in Boston, I was fortunate enough to finally get some real education <laughs> and, and, and sort of pay attention in school and learn things about system dynamics and how everything is interrelated and how not to judge the final product and how to see all the things and the math behind that of how events happen and how you can tweak things in order to get the final result. And it can apply to almost anything. And for us, we've used it in the stroke system around here and in, in order to figure out you know, how patients get and how access happens and how you can change workflow from push to pull systems. Um, and it's been, it's been really eye-opening to see medicine from a different perspective. We started this work to see if there could be some similarities that we're doing with stroke work here applied to Afghanistan. So working with the Harvard program for global surgery led by Key Park, we started to map out Afghanistan and which regions had what populations and, and so who had access to healthcare and within what time period. And we started to, this is during COVID because I got bored on the weeks that <laughs> I was hiding at home instead of working. And so we put together a group of very, very special people from Japan to uh, Boston, to George Washington, to Afghanistan, to Pakistan. Uh, this gentleman the right is, has a cell phone in Afghanistan, but no electricity. So we started to gather people to talk about opening up education and sort of really understanding capacity of neurosurgery within the country. And we started to map out where the public hospitals were that served the poorest of the poor. And we started to figure out where in the country 95% of the population had access to. The government fell in the midst of this. And, and there was an urgent need for equipment. And, and Afghanistan is second to Syria, the highest rate of uh, death from trauma especially in the 40 and under age. And these are text messages from re residents through WhatsApp and instruments and so forth. So we had built this pipeline of Boston, World Federation of Neurosurgery, Germany, Northwestern University in Pakistan, Afghanistan, all academic neurosurgeons. We raised $60,000 worth of money here quickly. Uh, as everybody was fleeing the country and the country is getting locked down, this $60,000 translated to $700,000 worth of equipment acquired um, uh, through the Majid Sami program with the World Federation of Neurosurgery through a wonderful man, Miguel Arias, uh, who helped us. Uh, the fundraising also brought special people to me. This is uh, Dr. James Muller. He, he's a Nobel Prize guy whose office is right, right there. It's a cardiologist that started this organization of physicians against nuclear weapons, which brought the United States and Russia together during the Cold War. And that organization got a Nobel Prize. Very, very, very special man. The instruments, while the country's getting locked down, went, like I said, from Germany to Pakistan, through the border, through pharmaceutical things, to all of these different regions, and actually made it into the hands of people that were actually operating. This is a, one side of the country. This is another cut side of the country. And what it did was it started to solidify those relationships. 
that we were there to help as opposed to take, which is what happens with Afghanistan. And we started to create educational opportunities during now, this is like a month ago at the Japanese, uh, Dr. Kato's uh, organization, ACNS. This is a woman neurosurgeon presenting on penetrating gun uh, gunshot injuries. So a woman neurosurgeon. The things that you hear are, 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 are sound bites sometimes, and, you, and you, we don't get correct information here. The next phase of this project is to now bring all of these 10 different hospitals online. We're working with a group uh, to put fiber optic, 5G technology here. First, it's for communication. Next step will be for telemedicine. And then maybe beyond that, it'll be for the things that are very, very, very special in the next thing. In endovascular and end endovascular, we've We've advanced instruments, we've advanced diseases. Now we're starting to explore processes. This is our new device, AI software to understand and diagnose. Imagine that boy who almost died herniated. This software and software like this, imagine what it can do in the future in these types of places where it gets automated and replaced with with, without having human capital to do that. Or this, robotics coming down the line that Stavros and her group, uh, Stav, Stav and her group are uh, working with where you're actually controlling catheters from remote areas. Outside the room, she does it now. Maybe you do it from outside the state. Maybe you do it from outside the country. And maybe instead of using the same technology, to drone and bomb people that we can actually lead with a humanitarian effort. And with the same flick of the hand, you can help people instead of hurting people. It's a pipe dream, it's a pipe dream. But for somebody like me, neurosurgery was pipe dream. I think mapping the country, understanding the healthcare system, taking in a niche through neurosurgery, even though it's a small pie, the processes look the same. The way a neurosurgical patient gets emergency care is the same way a trauma victim gets care, is the same way a young woman gets care. It's the same way in a country that has the highest infant mortality rate, where the future seeds of the country are dying, they get care. So maybe it unlocks a new way of thinking about things. This is the last slide. And it's the slide that <laughs> I learned at, at, at school. It's the social progress index. Every society, the basic pillars, as beautiful as democracy is, as, as beautiful as education is, the four basic needs are food, shelter, healthcare, and safety. It's the basic survival mechanism. And we are privileged, privileged to be at a corner of how societies function. And maybe we can solve these problems so that for our children, we have a better future. And for the children of that country, there's an opportunity to grow and maybe become somebody. Thank you. Well, Ali, this is, uh, I mean, I knew you were working on this. This is spectacular. And of course, it's your next big chapter in, in, in the, your life of passion that you've always led. And I'm, I'm, I commend you for all these efforts. And I am sure so many hurdles on the way. Well, if, if, if we spoke to you, if we speak to you in six months, what, what realistically, what do you think would be achieved six months from now through all your efforts and your colleagues? Dr. Morcos, already uh, there are scholarships given to women and passes to go to Spain, to go to Turkey, already we're presenting at the ACNS and there's collateral education. Uh, I'm hoping that there will be a bigger form of communication and I'm hoping that the world strategy changes because right now, because of all the things that are politically related, there's sanctions in the country. And when you put sanctions, children are starving, poverty is at an 
all time high. And it's going to be one of the biggest humanitarian crises of our time. Right. Yeah. So a humanitarian led effort, even if it's a small niche, even if it's grassroots, maybe shows people that there's a different way of engaging these places instead of engaging with fear of terrorism, that you actually engage with a humanitarian effort. I, I don't know. Like I said, it's a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. I'm exploring and, 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 and these talks I give to keep myself accountable so that I stick to my word. Um, have, you, have you talked to Bassant Mishra, the new chair of the WFNS Foundation? He replaced Miguel Arayez and, of course, Nelson Oyeshiko, who's a, you know, a, a chair of the WFNS, the president. I, I, have, I, I spoke with Dr. Oyeshiko. I haven't spoken Dr. Mishra yet. Yeah, you, you, you should. I mean, he, you know, um, anyway, but we can talk offline. And any, any of basic, this is probably the right time to ask Ali. I mean, you know, it's, the rest of the talks are very different, of course. Any of my co panelists or co director want to engage Ali with any questions? Or this is obviously very dear to his heart, as no, I think uh, you, you, you grabbed us from the heart. Uh, oh, Bob, Bobby, you want to say something? No, I was just, I was just going to say great work. I mean, I didn't have any questions, but it's you know obviously a monumental effort, and congratulations on the on the start. Thank you, thank you. Very proud of the work you're doing there. Uh, your wonderful things about you. Thank you for that comment. Thanks, Ellie. Oh, hold on. I I think I see Q and A's. Okay, Doctor Ahmad Atasi Ali says Ali, wonderful, very thoughtful. What are your thoughts? about endovascular robotics you want to <laughs> uh, I've I've re remotely played with it because it was developed back here uh, but the real expert uh, is Stavro and, and maybe she could sort of yeah. take that we, take we'll that. ask her a little later in in the in the talk okay and then Estefani Nicole Fuentes Roca wants to ask you thank you congratulations on your very touching lecture Great, enjoyed it a lot. She wants to ask if there are scholarships for residency in neurosurgery available. She's from Bolivia. Um, uh, Estefani, uh, uh, not for residency, but there are for fellowships. And, uh, you know, I'll probably answer you later offline, not to take too much time uh, from the speakers. I'll, I'll, I'll send you later a chat answer. Okay. Um, well, you started it very well for us, Ali. You put us a little heavy. <laughs> what? What's that? A little, a little heavy, but but I wouldn't uh, expect anything less from you. <laughs> but that's okay. But that's it's okay. You know, neurosurgery is not just mind. You know, neurosurgeons who have no heart are not good doctors. But we know that already. Uh, okay, Judy. Let's see if you have fixed your technical issues. Let me try again. So uh, Ali, I just wanted to commend you. That's amazing what you shared with us. The work that you did is just uh, incredible and uh, very inspiring for all of us. Um, so, uh, you know, just congratulations on that. And obviously very thought provoking. And Thank you so much. one of the best talks I've heard in a long time. Uh, Judy, before you start, uh, Ali, there are many more questions coming to you on the chat. Feel free to enter the Q and A and just answer them individually, so we don't, you know. Thank you. So hopefully, thank you, hopefully, I fix my epic uh, technical errors. Uh, so, you did. You did. Okay, great. Um, too many windows open. So all right. So uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and sort of um, reflect upon. Um, clinical decision-making uh, with uh, AVM treatments, especially after Aruba. And, uh, you know, of course I have to start by thanking actually my, um, uh, one of my former fellows and my current fellow um, and uh, James and Shahab. James is from Lebanon and Shahab is actually from Iran and, uh, you know, have done spectacular work um, over the years. And so I, uh, they helped me with these slides. And, you know, the reason that um, my talk um, always starts with uh, clinical scenarios is because that's sort of what we're here for, right? We're meaning as neurosurgeons, we're really about what uh, figuring out what's the best 
way to take care of our patients. And I am always reminded uh, by these three young women who all are, you know, in their uh, early 20s, uh, who presented with very different AVMs and had very different courses. And the ultimate question is, how do you figure out what's, what's the best um, way to, to serve them, um, to take care of them for their problem? And, um, you know, the first one just had headaches when she was studying and she thought she was super stressed and uh, ultimately got an imaging study. And it shows, you know, she's got this um, pre-motor and, uh, you know, motor um, AVM. The next one was a nurse who was working actually on uh, one of the hospital's um, unit uh, in neurology and had a seizure at work. Uh, and then the third, uh, unfortunately, came in on call and was very, very sick um, with a large ICH and uh, ultimately found to have an APM. So to try to answer these questions, you know, there's certain things that, you know, beginner, beginning learners always um, familiarize themselves with sort of what's the incidence of AVMs. Yes, it's a rare disease. Yes, um, it's, uh, you know, common can uh, be diagnosed with the ICH and it usually happens early on in one's life. Um, and then other presentations are seizures and headaches and neurologic deficits, right? So we know the basic stuff. Um, we also know um, really from early on, the teaching is that the risk of hemorrhage um, is uh, initially only about two to 3% per year, um, but that the mortality is the problem, that uh, there's a high rate of mortality, nearly a third, and then um, about 10 to 20% of people after a hemorrhage have a long-term disability. And then furthermore, if you have one bleed, you're more likely to have a second bleed. Um, the quick and easy way to calculate the risk of hemorrhage uh, over one's lifetime when you're, you know, there's a patient sitting in front of you in the office um, is to use the simple formula of 105 minus the age and that you can get an estimation of what's their lifetime risk. And then listed in the table below are, are the uh, sort of um, uh, classic papers that talk about uh, natural history, but they are all mostly retrospective. And that's where the two to 4% comes from. So Aruba uh, was published in 2014, and that really changed uh, how different uh, practitioners looked at AVMs. And so um, this really, um, the main conclusions were that if you treated AVMs with interventional therapy, you had three times the rate of death and neurologic disability than if you compared it to medical management alone. And that's shown by the Kaplan-Meier curve where you know, the blue is uh, much higher than the red. And, and that sort of threw everybody for a loop and there was lots written about it and so forth. And most recently in 2020, there's actually a uh, sort of the final Aruba results uh, that were published. Um, and this follows patients out to 50 months. And they concluded, you see with the similar Kaplan-Meier curve where the blue uh, of interventional therapy is associated with a lot more stroke or death than the red line that depicts medical management, even at the long-term period. And this is, uh, even though the people who were at risk um, are much lower than in the first um, publication, uh, nevertheless, um, the, the concluding uh, comments from the authors is that um, you know, there's still a lot of people who suffer from interventional therapy. So, um, so it's important to uh, have an overview of, of what Aruba has done in terms of uh, spurring and inspiring a lot of different publications uh, that many authors have come up with in utilizing Aruba eligible patients to look at what happens to patients um, who undergo various treatment modalities. And here I'm just listing all the different publications. You know, this is just a sampling of publications uh, where people look at Aruba eligible patients who undergo microsurgery or Aruba eligible patients who undergo embolization alone and those who undergo radiosurgery. I'll just note that in the embolization only group, uh, the um, risk of uh, complication or stroke or death uh, is higher you see, uh, than the ones who undergo microsurgery alone or radiosurgery alone. And uh, same thing is borne out for um, radiosurgery and multimodal uh, therapy. So basically there's lots and lots of uh, authors, investigators who have demonstrated much better results um, 
in looking at their experience in treating Aruba eligible patients using carefully selected modalities that are um, appropriate. So in, in looking through the literature, uh, I'll just point out this systematic review and meta-analysis by um, Bijam et al. And that actually predated Aruba. And they were the first to actually um, make very clear that there are varying rates of case fatality and long-term risk of hemorrhage and complications, and also in obliteration rates after different types of interventions, so that all interventions are not the same. You know, that's not surprising to any of us, um, but uh, the authors of Aruba lumped everything together, you know, lumped embolization only with microsurgery, lumped uh, radio, stereotactic radio surgery with multimodal, multimodal treatment. So uh, that's not exactly a fair um, way of looking at things. Um, and that was actually published in JAMA in 2011. Um, where the meta-analysis actually included nearly 14,000 patients um, in this group. Um, next, uh, I'll present this paper, who I think the first author is your PGY3 resident, Eva Wu, is that her name? So, um, so is that right? I think it is the same, I, I believe it's the same Eva, but um, uh, so this is from Babu Welsh, and uh, uh, they looked at a review of uh, what are the outcomes after uh, embolization of brain AVMs with the intent to cure? And you can see that they break down the complications um, by complication type, you know, whether it's a hemorrhage, ischemia, seizures, uh, temporary uh, focal neurologic deficit or permanent. And you can see the numbers highlighted below. And um, this uh, goes to show you that, you know, the risk of embolization is not trivial. And, and, and definitely significant when um, the intention is to cure. And, and they do conclude that um, cure via embolization is, is more of a bonus than, uh, than expected. Um, other authors, so Nick Bambakitis and his group um, also did uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And uh, they showed this in this very interesting paper of uh, comparing stereotactic radio surgery with and without pre-radio surgery embolization. And they found that uh, there's lower obliteration rates uh, when you combine embolization and SRS versus SRS alone. Um, moving on to um, uh, other authors, this is the same uh, type of uh, finding. Uh, you know, Bobby Stark was on this, um, you know, uh, back in the day. Uh, and um, uh, Jason Sheehan is the senior author on this and also showing that um, obliteration rates are lower after radio surgery if it is prece preceded by embolization. So um, here is, um, here I'm summarizing other um, meta-analyses that are, are very um, revealing. And, and the one on the left comes out of China. Uh, where they showed also that obliteration rate um, on angiogram, so not just other non-invasive imaging, but on angiogram was definitely lower when you combine radiosurgery and embolization. Um, others showed that uh, the with this combined um, treatment that the re-hemorrhage rate at three years was not very different. And furthermore, the uh, rate of neurologic deficit was also not very different. So sort of leading one to conclude that um, embolization uh, preceding radiosurgery uh, may not be uh, the best option. So our colleagues in the Netherlands recently uh, put this out, which I think is a, a fantastic um, commentary. It's uh, published in Stroke earlier this year, um, talking about um, uh, Aruba and, and sort of you know, how to approach the thinking behind unruptured AVMs and uh, indicating how that's changed. And they had excellent um, um, comments, which I'll just briefly summarize that um, are, are shown here. And basically with this type of analysis, they're basically showing that if you look at publications by other authors and uh, prior experience with microsurgery uh, depicted on the top left with endovascular, with serotactic radiosurgery, that the risk of a problem is much lower than what Aruba uh, demonstrates. 
so that basically um, the the results from the Aruba investigators are really not comparable to what exists um, published by other uh, uh, surgeons. And um, because of that, um, you know, it really boils down to um, that Aruba was an analysis of decision making, not of the intervention, right? Because it was really just lumping together all interventions, you know, didn't, re didn't have any regard for what kind of modality people were put through. And it really was just a decision making analysis, not, not, an, not a analysis really honing in on the, uh, the success of the intervention. So because other investigators have definitely shown that there's a potential to achieve good outcomes, how do you risk stratify patients on a case-by-case -case basis? So one can use grading systems and risk scores, such as Spetzler-Martin that everybody know, uh, knows. You can supplement that with the Lawton uh, scale that takes into uh, um, consideration age and uh, diffuseness. And then you can combine uh, that with the spetzler ponce classification to sort of have a class A, which is the grade one and twos, the class B, which is the grade threes, and then the class C with a four and five, which basically nobody should intervene on. So, so um, this demonstrates that the risk of hemorrhage has been studied exhaustively by other authors, that each of these numbers represents a publication and um, various factors have, have been implicated. Uh, such as size and deep venous drainage and you know, feeding artery aneurysm and so forth. And there's a lot of controversy because you see how the columns of numbers, there's all these numbers on the left that basically show that there is a significance with these factors. And then there's also numbers on the right where it shows that these factors don't make any um, difference. And so there is um, some heterogeneity. So we proposed um, a, a, a scoring system to try to... Uh, um, predict the risk of hemorrhage in patients. And we looked at our cohort of um, 755 patients. We split them into a training data set, into a validation data set, and did univariable analysis followed by the multivariable. We did the model building, the uh, ROC analysis, and then validated the model uh, back with the entire um, cohort. And we uh, called this the red AVM score. And I'll just go through that quickly. So we took these characteristics and basically did the univariable analysis and picked out that these were the significant factors, race, nidus size, uh, location, uh, number of feeders and venous drainage. Um, we then uh, uh, did this analysis and you see how nidus size with the multivariable analysis does not have statistical significance. However, because nidus size is so important in the literature, we forced it into the model. So then we um, show here that the area under the curve for the training data set is uh, hovers around 0.7, which is very similar to the validation data set. And for context, the area under the curve for the Spetzler-Martin grading score is about 0.66. And then in a, in a field outside of neurosurgery for the has bled score, which is used to uh, predict bleeding in AFib, um, their area under the curve is 0.72. So our model has a decent comparability. Um, so when we use the complete data set, this is what we get. Um, the acronym red AVM stands for these factors. So R is race and we uh, uh, weight it double because the beta coefficient is twice as high as the other factors. And so uh, race, then ED is exclusive deep location. A is for AVM size, small versus large. V is for venous drainage, whether it's exclusive deep versus um, other. And then M is for mono arterial feeding. And you can see the, um, uh, the block um, uh, score here that for every incremental increase in, in the AVM score, the predicted probability of hemorrhage goes up by uh, uh, incrementally by about 10. And so there's this stepwise increase uh, and starts from a baseline risk of about 16%. And there's no overlap in the predicted risk. So how do we apply that? So here's an example of a young lady who um, is uh, white and she presents with migraines and a right visual field aura. If we apply the Spetzler-Martin grading score, she um, you know, is, is given a pretty high uh, grade four because of the size being big and eloquence. Um, and then um, the uh, Spetzler-Ponce uh, class is C. 
uh, if we add the supplementary motor, I mean, supplementary uh, score from Lawton, um, it also is a supplementary grade four. So this is a high grade AVM basically. Um, and if we apply the red AVM calculator and look at the factors, um, the anatomical factors, we come up with the red AVM score of zero, which means that her risk of hemorrhage is 16%. So when you combine high grade in terms of treatment and lower risk of lifetime hemorrhage, um, it is reasonable to uh, consider a more conservative approach. And that's what happened in her. She got migraine medications and she's actually doing quite well recently. Uh, married, I believe. Um, alternatively, if we apply this red AVM score to a, a young man who's black, presented with severe headaches and vomiting, if you use the Spetzler-Martin uh, scoring system, he gets a, a grade three. He's spetzler Ponce class, class B. With the supplementary, um, he's grade three, so sort of intermediate um, grade. And then if you apply the red AVM calculator and you know take into uh, account that he's um, a non-white race has a, um, you know, it's not a deep location. It's a, uh, uh, it's a small AVM. It's a exclusively um, a deep. His risk of hemorrhage is 42%. So he's a reasonable candidate for treatment. And indeed he underwent a uh, resection. Um, so applying this scoring system to the three young women that we uh, started with, you can see that in the um, student who was stressed out from her studying, um, her risk of hemorrhage is 16%. Um, so she was managed uh, with uh, radio surgery um, at first. Um, and then uh, uh, the 25-year-old nurse, um, she comes up with a, a risk of hemorrhage of 54%. She was treated with resection. And then unfortunately, the um, demonstration that this uh, uh, predictive score ha has some validity uh, comes from this 23-year-old who presented unresponsive and, and had a, was a mortality. You know, using the, AV, the red AVM scoring system, it actually is 58% uh, risk of hemorrhage. So um, this uh, red AVM score has been externally validated uh, by uh, Clemens and his colleague, uh, Christoph Grissenauer. Um, they applied this scoring system to patients um, at their institution. And you can see the graphs here that um, uh, the distribution of the patients by score uh, follows a similar pattern. And then the proportion with the uh, rupture also follows a very similar pattern. The bar graphs are, are, very, are um, uh, pretty um, uh, similar. And then the uh, area under the curve uh, also um, is uh, pretty, pretty similar. So we're happy to see that there is some external validation. So in conclusion, um, the curative embolization of AVMs should be considered an unanticipated benefit of such therapy rather than a goal. Um, second, embolization prior to SRS decreases the rate of AVM obliteration without significant effects on post-op complications and mortality. And so therefore embolization should be performed only after weighing the merits of partial nidal reduction uh, and the risks of multimodality treatment, where the probability um, uh, um, um, uh, may be lower of obliteration. Uh, and lastly, the red AVM score represents a risk stratification tool that demonstrates some promise in the prediction of natural history in a real world clinical setting. And because there's this growing emphasis on judicious patient selection for AVM treatment, the score complements other grading systems that primarily assess the procedural risk, you know, such as the Spencer Martin grade and the supplementary Lawton scale. So uh, that's it for me. I uh, will appreciate very much your attention. Thank you. Judy, that's, that's phenomenal work and of course highly needed. And that's, that shows you when you really analyze a problem to the depth that you and your group have done what you come up with. Um, so with the red AVM score, looking now retrospectively to previous publications, what, what have you seen can be discounted as not not really significant in predicting rupture of the pre former papers that have been published the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. what, what factors you think are really not relevant and were talked about before? Right, right. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's so much, I think, you know, because it's all, it is so much is based on retrospective uh, information um, that uh, it is 
I, I hesitate to say that anything can be discounted entirely, right? Um, but, you know, it is true that some angiographic features um, we were not able to demonstrate as, as uh, predictive. And that, but that is true for our cohort, which is, you know, over 700 people, but that's still a small number compared to, you know, everybody else, you know, is experienced. So we don't get things like Venus, you know, outflow stenosis as, as being, you know, important. Um, we didn't, we didn't, you know, um, get location um, uh, in terms of like specific, uh, you know, basal ganglia versus like brainstem, you know, we just have deep as a sort of general category, but uh, we couldn't get much more granular than that. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think a very, I mean, the ED one makes perfect sense, huh? exclusive deep. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, as opposed to multiple venous outflow. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, any, any of my, any of the panelists want to tackle, to ask a question or otherwise we leave it to the discussion at the end. Ali, you want to say something? Sure, uh, Judy, wonderful talk. What roles do you see for embolization? Um, yeah. and, and in what cases do you use it in your practice? I do, I do. Uh, so it's, for me, I find it most helpful uh, for uh, uh, preparation for surgery. And I, I tell patients that. I find it's, it's incredibly helpful um, to sort of uh, mark the feeders if, uh, you know, if that happens, right. And, you know, um, decrease the, uh, uh, um, turger in the AVM. And, and, uh, so I think it makes, you know, it becomes, it becomes an easier mass to remove if there's some embolization material, um, you know, in AVMs that come to resection. So that's, that's really where, where I use it. I used to do it before radio surgery and I've gotten away from it actually because of these, you know, uh, other authors publications. Judy, I have a quick question. Thank you for this uh, great lecture. I had the uh, pleasure to actually uh, uh, see you speak before COVID at Jefferson on the topic. My question to you is for angiographically cured AVMs, either via embolization or stereotactic radiosurgery, you still recommend resection um, for, for cure? Yeah. Um... So I don't unless they hemorrhage, and I have actually encountered that. So I have patients that have had angiographic cure, um, whether that's with embolization or with uh, radiosurgery, and years later they present with hemorrhage. And um, I have a very remarkable patient, incredibly remarkable in that she had every GI surgery possible, uh, cholecystectomy, um, I think, uh, uh, what else? I think like, you know, esophagectomy. I mean, she had so many GI procedures because she kept on presenting with nausea and vomiting over, uh, I want to say over two years. And it was basically, I think, because of temporary increases in ICP, because she would have these small hemorrhages at the site of her obliterated AVM, technically obliterated because it was not filling on angio. Um, but you know, she eventually developed hydrocephalus. Um, so, so she was actually having communicating hydrocephalus and I did take out her APM and it was this rigid calcified hard mass. Um, yeah. So just incredible. You sort of have to be aware of that possibility years down the road. Great. Thank you. Oh, Ali, you have something else? No. Dr. Morkos, you, you used to talk about angiographic negative and using other modalities if it enhances on MRI that you may think it's still active. I mean, I have seen, I, I, as you know, Roberto and I have had a few cases where it's completely dead on angiogram and uh, that we've had to operate on. And, you know, they were live, not very high flow, but certainly live at surgery. Um, we saw that enhancement helps predict it, but you know, we don't have tons of those patients. Uh, um, yeah, it's interesting. What, the staff, did you ask the question for, because you had a contrary point of view about it or? No, actually, um, similar to what uh, Judy suggests, we've had a few radio surgery cases hmm. uh, where sometimes upon completion of the, um, uh, you know, obliteration of the AVM, you will have right as the AVM occludes, you will have a hemorrhage and some of the hemorrhages could be delayed. There are three or four in our series that I could recall 
And I was just wondering, you know, is there any way we could predict which one of those would hemorrhage and which one of those are worth uh, resecting? Mm -hmm. um, some of the criticisms I've heard from other colleagues is whether there are some still peel components of the AVM that continue to fill. And if the AVM has been embolized, the embolicids, you know, precludes you visualizing that on angiography. Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be great to select those for resection. Yeah, yes, indeed. Okay. Um, let's actually, Ignacio, can I ask you to play now Clemens Schirmer pre-recorded presentation? Yes, on sir. Modality, on modality naive a treatment of unruptured aneurysms. He's somewhere on a plane or so. I'm not sure where he was going. Good evening, good day, wherever you are. I'm hoping that you're enjoying this symposium. And I would like to thank uh, Jack and the organizers for the opportunity to come back to you. I'm going to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to call this modality naive outpatient treatment of unruptured aneurysms. Basically, what we're talking about, and here are my non relevant disclosures to this. Um, that at Geisinger, we've been really trying to push the envelope both on the endovascular side, but also on the open surgical side. And I believe that the second part of this is really the key to bringing the right therapy to the right patient without having to discuss the externalities of the treatment. How long are you going to stay in the hospital? How long is your scar? All those things that don't really matter too much when it comes to the actual treatment of that unruptured aneurysm but matter very much for that patient. And I'll get into this a little bit more. For those of you who don't know what Geisinger is, we're a very large integrated healthcare system in the middle of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we have a robust number of uh, cases here. But also across the country, that the treatment of unruptured aneurysms uh, has been decreasing on the open surgical side. We've been clipping less and less aneurysms. And this is just a graph here on the right side that conveniently enough stops in 2006. Um, I would um, venture to guess that if we continue this graph that we're looking at a very low percentage of patients that still undergo uh, clipping of an aneurysm. Although we do believe as surgeons that oftentimes the uh, treatment option of clipping is actually a better option for that uh, patient. Um, and uh, we do uh, think that uh, the treatment of an unruptured aneurysm really should uh, minimize the actual morbidity and mortality because we're taking a patient that is otherwise mostly uh, completely normal and has no symptoms from that aneurysm. Um, and we currently overemphasize perhaps uh, the treatment modality and that the patient uh, preference, uh, if you allow for that, is oftentimes based on drivers of outcome that don't overlap with the technical success. Again, patients worry about how long they're gonna be out of work, how long are they gonna stay in the hospital, uh, how long is their scar, uh, how much is gonna be uh, the pain uh, after that procedure. And uh, here we sought to demonstrate that uh, if you combine the right elements of innovation on the open surgical side, um, in uh, the cerebrovascular arena uh, that you can employ a modality naive approach to this um, and achieve highly reliable and successful outcomes. Um, and this in particular is also relevant in this time of COVID-19 where we continue to have and see more often uh, right now resource constraints uh, where we don't have any beds, uh, we don't have any outpatient beds um, or the ability to bring patients in for elective procedures. Um, and uh, looking at all these components of care that allow us to still provide care to the patient, bring that care to the patient in a reliable and successful manner um, is really worthwhile and taking apart this care pathway. Setting the stage, craniotomies are not that easy. Um, uh, we believe that they are, but um, uh, if you dive into this a little bit, um, we looked at uh, roughly 180,000 patients or so over the last seven years. Um, and you can see that uh, the mortality rate is not um, you know, that low. It's uh, above 5%. 
Um, even though uh, you can look at different age strata here, um, it is uh, significant uh, to talk about. It has a significant uh, complication rate and re-emission also are uh, a vexing problems. Um, and of course, the length of stay across the country for craniotomy in general, and this is not for just aneurysms, um, is somewhere around five to six days. Um, and uh, patients also really care about that outcome a couple of years later when they come back to you. And my experience has been that they care more about their scar or that dimple where the skull has retracted, the scalp has retracted into the um, uh, craniotomy hole the burr hole uh, about uh, that, then uh, whether or not you saved their life uh, from a very technically challenging aneurysm. Um, and, uh, you know, we see a lot of times uh, patients with this kind of a craniotomy, uh, but uh, we really want to get to these minimally invasive approaches, which have a lot of advantages. Um, if you combine that as an approach type uh, with the right uh, early recovery model, um, and we've uh, done this here at Geisinger that uh, we put together a bundle um, that is relevant to all craniotomies, but in particular also allows for a fast track uh, where we send the patient home the same day under certain selected circumstances. And that includes the avoidance of uh, 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 opioids, um, intraoperative scalp blocks, um, looking at less indwelling catheters for short procedures, um, using, you know, for example, uh, not a groin uh, stick, but a radial A-line for uh, intraoperative angiograms if necessary. Um, and we've had a lot of success for that. Um, and this really sets the stage that uh, we can compare our outcomes before and after, um, but really have a good way of uh, minimizing the uh, perioperative morbidity, mortality, complication rates, and other uh, metrics on the open side. Um, uh, and uh, really focus, therefore, on uh, what is mattering to the patient. You know, they want to go home uh, as early as possible, and we're able to show that our discharge disposition um, has increased for open surgical procedures. They go home more often, and that is not um, uh, bought or, or encountering um, a higher rate of readmissions. So we're not uh, paying the price for sending the patients home too early, perhaps. Um, and, uh, you know, now we're going to look at, can we really measure a difference if we look at that different modality between endovascular treatment and open vascular treatment? So here we are going to consider a five-year analysis, prospectively collected and independently adjudicated uh, patients. Um, the total uh, number is 585, but we excluded a couple of surgeons who did less than two procedures in total. Um, and uh, so we're left with 578 patients. Um, you can see here the distribution of the different practitioners. Um, there's uh, uh, one surgeon who did about a third of the procedures, and then we have uh, three more that did uh, roughly another uh, half uh, uh, combined. Um, and uh, the basic demographics are here. The median age is about 58 years old. 90% um, of these were less than 80 years old. 72% uh, were female. And reflecting the... Uh, geography here that we are in the middle of Pennsylvania, 92% of our patients are Caucasian. Um, and we're looking at uh, middle of 2015 um, to the middle of 2020. Um, and 94% of these had an elective admission status. Uh, both facilities uh, that were considered in this analysis are a comprehensive stroke led uh, center um, from a joint commission perspective. And you can see here that um, uh, the uh, different um, uh, centers, I'm sorry, all three centers are joint commission uh, uh, centers. Um, and um, we uh, clipped about 23% of these patients and we treated 77% of these patients uh, from an endovascular perspective. Um, about 3% of these patients were enrolled in what we call a fast track program, meaning that they were considered for going home the same day. Um, that is uh, not the standard, but we offer this to patients and we also select our patients for that option. If we think that you're a good candidate for that, um, most patients that are uh, appreciate that option very much. Um, and uh, as you can also see here, we instituted what we call the proven recovery craniotomy module, which is a early recovery module around craniotomies. 
in about 12% of these patients, 88% um, of these patients were still treated under the uh, standard of care. Um, and that includes the 88% includes the endovascular patients. Looking a little bit more into the demographics of this, um, you can see here that the age ranges are not significantly different between endovascular therapy and open clipping therapy. Um, and uh, the treatment overview is as such that uh, we observed a certain baseline of uh, 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 complications, mortalities, and others. Um, and you can see here that our uh, baseline mortality rates, complications rates are around what I mentioned before, um, eight, nine percent. Uh, readmission rates uh, are actually uh, quite good, uh, good uh, over 30 days. Um, they are between uh, four and uh, five percent. Uh, and uh, a lot of our patients are being discharged to home or self-care, uh, but there's a significant number that uh, needed uh, to have rehab or other uh, support afterwards. And again, these are patients that are coming from home, so they're not uh, arriving from a rehab uh, or nursing facility for the most part. It is also important to keep in mind that the early recovery modules started with a single surgeon, uh, yours truly, uh, but we expanded that to multiple surgeons and we can show and look into the differences between that single surgeon cohort and the multi-surgeon cohort. Because again, a lot of practices that we do are easily done when you're looking at just one surgeon. The trick sometimes is to expand them and come back and make that a new standard of care that everyone subscribes to and is actually reliably able to participate in. Um, you can see here the breakdown uh, over time. Um, the uh, majority of these uh, are done in the uh, comparison group uh, because we go further back, uh, but we can look at uh, the entire proven recovery group um, and uh, see that there's not a lot of a difference here. Looking at just the general trend of the uh, event rates, um, we can show here that, of course, the majority of these procedures done uh, really, really well. They did not have any mortalities or complications. That's where you see those big uh, fat uh, dots here at the zero mark uh, for a lot of these. Um, the length of stay is you know, relatively short uh, for a lot of these, but you can see a difference here between open clipping and uh, also the cost per case. Um, that's important. Endovascular procedures are more expensive. Um, that has to do with the direct cost of some of the devices that we use. Um, but uh, you really have to weigh that against the whole picture sometimes. Um, and that's an important nuance to keep in mind. There's an evolution over time here. You can see that there's very little change in the endovascular group of patients on the left side here. Uh, when we're looking at uh, the, for example, the length of stay, uh, we have seen a little bit of a trend uh, to being discharged uh, on the same day. Uh, but, you know, overall, that's been pretty stable. The length of stay was not very different before and after for the whole group. Uh, but there's a significant difference uh, in the uh, uh, group that uh, were treated with uh, open clipping and uh, where ERAS or the early recovery module was adopted. Um, and you can see that here on the right side um, in 2018, 19 and 20, you see a significant decrease um, in those uh, length of stay um, data points that uh, allow us to drive an inference here as to uh, that we're essentially converging to the standard that the endovascular group is already setting. The single, experience, uh, single surgeon experience does matter. You can see here the difference in blue compared to the red, uh, the red denoting the single surgeon experience here. But overall, we see the same trend lines, and that's important. Uh, it's just going to take a couple more uh, time uh, periods to uh, adopt and uh, converge to that single surgeon experience. And you can see that here on the right that the adoption and the convergence is a little bit slower. The slope of that blue curve is less uh, uh, um, uh, driven down. Uh, but uh, again, this is the endovascular experience here in blue. Um, whereas you see that for the whole group, um, the length of stay on the open surgical side is converging down and will perhaps actually uh, go less than um, the uh, endovascular average. Uh, but that's probably uh, just an um, artifact here of the uh, first order linear approximation of this curve. Um, and it will probably uh, uh, converge to being about the same number. Looking at what we call O2E ratio, so we have a risk-adjusted outside adjudicated observation 
Um, we use Premier for this. Uh, there's other um, databases that you can use for this. Uh, most of you are uh, either a member of Premier, University Health Consortium, or others that allow you to have an outside measure or benchmark of quality and looking at your risk adjusted cases and how that compares to uh, your comparison institutions. Uh, looking at these O2E ratios, we uh, note that a ratio of one means that your expectation and your observation line up, meaning that you're as good or as bad as your comparison institutions that you picked. If your observation is less than one, um, your OTE ratio is less than one, you're a little bit better than the outside benchmark. And if it's more than one, you're a little bit worse than the outside benchmark. And you can see here that, uh, you know, some of these are quite high, um, but uh, the, the range is quite high. So we do have some outliers, um, but uh, for the most part, the median values, and that's what you're looking here for, uh, is around one, um, and that's really, really good. Um, but you can also see that there's a little bit of a left shift in the recovery um, and uh, cost, length of stay, uh, complication rates in the group that was done during the time that we instituted the early recovery module for open surgical procedures. Mortality remains really, really good. Um, we uh, did have a few outliers. Um, because of our low numbers, um, having one or two events uh, is uh, significantly different. So in the uh, time period that we had uh, open recovery, we did have two events that were mortalities, um, and that is significantly worse than in the group before. Uh, but you know, overall, these are rare events, uh, and uh, we will have to dive into this a little bit uh, of how to properly couch this in a statistical manner, uh, because I believe actually strongly that that's uh, not a correct way of looking at this. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, we were significantly worse for mortality in the period of time um, that uh, we were using early recovery and the fast track program for um, uh, uh, craniotomies uh, and clipping of unruptured aneurysms, although none of the patients that uh, died were subject or part of the fast track program. Complication rates uh, are overall non, not changed. Um, that, that is uh, about the same. Uh, there's a little bit of a trend uh, to less rates, but that is not statistically different. And uh, diving into length of stay, um, there was no longer a difference, which is really what we're looking for here. Um, and uh, the endovascular length of stay was uh, 0.74 days. Uh, the open length of stay is 0.73 days. Um, and you can see here, the differences are really not existent anymore. Um, and that is uh, significantly um, uh, better than the baseline. Um, of course, if you do have a complication that will uh, adjust uh, the length of stay and express itself in a longer length of stay. However, um, that is the same um, between a single surgeon experience uh, and also a, a group experience. Um, and it doesn't really matter uh, if you uh, have uh, a, a um, complication or a readmission. Um, and that is uh, being sort of like, you know, pushed together and we see the same uh, trends here. Uh, what is really important is the discharge disposition. We made significant headway here. So we started in this quadrant where we're seeing that a lot of patients were not discharged to home anymore, even though they came from home. You can see here that a lot of patients went to rehab or even nursing facilities. Uh, whereas uh, we now are in a position to say that uh, most of the patients, uh, if not 100% on the open uh, clipping side, actually went uh, home. Um, and uh, that's a significant difference and positive uh, change. Um, again, all cause readmissions. So again, we were seeing before a significant difference here that was much higher um, on the open surgical side. Um, uh, but uh, there is no difference anymore. And again, that's what we're trying to achieve here. And then also cost um, is obviously related uh, to the treatment modality and the vascular procedures, again, are more expensive, but it is not a longer, no longer related to the operator. Um, and mind you, I didn't say this before, that all the operators in this uh, cohort are dual trained um, uh, surgeons with one notable exception uh, of one of our partners who only does the endovascular procedures. Um, 
Looking at the O2E ratios here, uh, we are able to show that we have a convergence um, towards one, which is really important. Um, and uh, before that, uh, we uh, were seeing um, that uh, the endovascular procedures were way out of line and the uh, open procedures were a little bit above one. Now our open surgical procedures are actually significantly less than one, uh, which is not good for the comparison of endovascular procedures, uh, but it is a very significant development on the open side uh, because it basically allowed us to uh, bend that cost curve down, uh, which is uh, something that is uh, difficult to achieve these days when you have the cost of medical inflation, which generally drives these procedures up um, and uh, includes the L2E ratios. So in conclusion, I want to uh, point out to you that uh, we are at this point in the uh, enviable position that we have very little differences between the open uh, surgical procedures for the treatment of unruptured aneurysms and endovascular procedures. Uh, we have uh, a mortality rates uh, less than uh, 2%, um, and we have readmission and uh, complication rates that are very, very low. Um, compared to national standards. Um, our length of stay is, as you can see here, uh, roughly 1.3 uh, to 1.4 days. Um, and the open uh, uh, surgical length of stay is actually less than the endovascular length of stay. And uh, that's been a journey that's been really uh, beneficial because it basically allows us to leverage uh, the innovation on the open surgical side correctly and come back to the patient with the right recommendation that is based on what is the best technical treatment for that aneurysm, rather than to focus on those externalities um, that um, both the surgeon perhaps, but more so the patient is really focused on and uh, allows the patient to participate in this decision-making process without having to worry about those externalities. And that's what we call a modality naive treatment approach to this, uh, because you achieve that technical outcome without having to look at those externalities. And the second uh, takeaway from this perhaps is that 96% of these can be done as an outpatient, uh, which is really important in this time of resource constraints and the inability to bring patients as an inpatient into our hospitals. And, and it allows us to continue to drive um, the ability to provide care for these patients without having to worry about that this is a um, undue risk for the patient um, and uh, doesn't allow us um, to uh, focus on um, the sicker patients in the hospital, but uh, stop uh, doing uh, care for those patients who need this and are really anxious waiting to have their unruptured aneurysm treated. Uh, with that, I hope that this was uh, helpful and happy to take any questions. Um, you probably all know how to reach out to me. I do want to thank uh, my whole group for participating in this. Um, and uh, this has been quite a journey over the last five years, uh, but uh, we really felt um, that uh, this is a really good approach to bring uh, care to our patients. And it's been uh, wildly successful so far. Thank you very much. Well, I thought that was great. Um, I don't know if any of the, if, if you want to say a comment, I know he's not here to answer, but any, any remarks, any comments before I invite staff to speak? Okay. Uh, staff, bring it home. Okay. Saving the Greek for last. Saving the wonderful name of Stavropoula. I don't know why we should quit calling you staff. Stavropoula is so much more you know, musical. I'm going to respectfully correct the accent. It's Stavropoula, but you're really close. Okay. Well, had you told me, I would have said it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, again, really a uh, big thank you to Jacques for the invitation and a uh, big shout out to uh, Bobby Stark, who was here at Jefferson and uh, has really co-authored uh, most of our papers, has done a great job in uh, uh, doing statistical uh, work for us. Uh, these are my disclosures, and main disclosure is really uh, I'm very fortunate to uh, be at Jefferson with this phenomenal group led by Robert Rosenwasser and my partner in crime, uh, Pascal. So we're going to move through quickly, uh, like the endovascular cases go, Jacques, and uh, uh, we're going to, of course, talk about endovascular, which uh, really uh, started by Egas Muniz with the uh, introduction of angiography, obviously. Um, Cerebrovascular had already taken uh, 
uh, uh, had starred with Harvey Cushing was the first to describe wrapping of aneurysms and packing them with muscle to elicit thrombosis, perhaps a, an early attempt for endovascular, uh, but it wasn't a, a, until Dr. Walter Dandy performed the first aneurysm clip. So we have uh, progressed since then from the OR to the INR, and uh, uh, this is the interventional suite, the new uh, uh, way of treating aneurysms. And by the end of the day, I'm gonna show you that we're gonna progress from the INR to home. Uh, this is the evolution of endovascular neurosurgery in terms of devices. And uh, flow diversion came a little over a decade ago, and it was a major disruptive innovation in current endovascular devices that you see here uh, with the major change in aneurysm treatment. There's a great paper uh, in AJNR that was published two years ago that really shows the endothelialization process that occurs and facilitates the membrane formation uh, following linear flow diversion as shown here. These are the current FDA approved flow diverters, the pipeline device, which is nearly uh, 10 years uh, uh, in approval and usage. Uh, and then uh, other linear flow diverters, so the surplus and thread devices. And then we now have a new generation of flow diversion, the endosacular kind uh, with the web and upcoming contour devices. So um, these are the major trials that I've left to uh, uh, the safety and efficacy of flow diversion. Um, and uh, the progressive aneurysm occlusion, uh, which you see here, um, and uh, most importantly, safety, uh, very safe procedures with very low morbidity and mortality. Uh, this led to the FDA approval of the pipeline uh, device as the first device, uh, and on-label um, approval earlier on was uh, restricted to aneurysms from the petrus to the hypophyseal segment, uh, which obviously was... Uh, uh, a little restrictive early on. And then there were uh, several studies and uh, registries that helped us with uh, uh, some of the findings. For example, the interpret registry showed that the posterior circulation had higher risk when usage of flow diversion for treatment of aneurysms. So we really take that into account when we use flow diverting devices. These are some of our papers and some of our experiences. Um, these are our uh, first four uh, aneurysms. Significant learning curve. Uh, you'll see that our complication in our first 40 was as high as 14%, uh, major and minor complications. And uh, if you split them into groups, we'll see the first uh, uh, 20 devices, significant morbidity, and then the second uh, 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 and third groups, really uh, nearly 0% uh, uh, major complications. So uh, the treatment of paraclinal artery aneurysms have, has really rev been revolutionized since then. Uh, you can see here several paraclinal aneurysms uh, treated with a single device with excellent results. Some of these aneurysms are very complex. This is a trilobe of thalamic artery aneurysm with a single device, a complete aneurysm occlusion and obliteration. Uh, recently, the premier study, which was a prospective multi-center uh, uh, study, uh, confirmed the efficacy of the uh, device, uh, nearly 80% uh, complete aneurysm occlusion. Uh, in one year. And uh, again, the safety of the device, 2% uh, uh, major morbidity and neurological death at a year. Um, unlike previous studies, uh, in this study, we've proven that only one device is required as opposed to the prior studies. And that really decreases the overall morbidity of the procedure. Uh, some myths that uh, we, I wanna discuss um, in terms of flow diversion, uh, that you shouldn't cross certain arteries, for example, the ophthalmic artery that it will occlude. This has been well published in the greatest majority, 90% of the cases where the ophthalmic artery stays patent. In the remainder, um, we may have a uh, asymptomatic occlusion and very rarely, uh, less than 5%, you can have a symptomatic occlusion. Uh, when uh, treating large aneurysms uh, unruptured, uh, we, we've uh, published our series, and we found that the, using a flow diversion versus coil is actually more efficacious, and uh, um, uh, we have a significantly higher aneurysm uh, completely occlude with flow diversion, uh, nearly 90%, as opposed to the traditional coiling embolization. So perhaps more studies need to be done for these large aneurysms to compare with open surgery. Uh, in terms of follow-up uh, angiography, we published that once the aneurysm is 100% occluded, uh, there has been zero reports of uh, recurrence of the aneurysm. Now we have long-term follow-up up to 10 years. 
Therefore, even at six months, you can tell comfortably the patient that has, they've, they have been cured, similar to you telling your clipped patient that their aneurysm has been cured. Um, what about the instant stenosis? Some of the predictors that we found, uh, almost all of them were asymptomatic, and the main predictor is the lack of aspirin therapy. So if you're going to use flow diversion, um, long-term aspirin therapy, uh, uh, aspirin 81 milligrams daily suffices. Uh, we will be protective against uh, instant stenosis. Uh, another predictor that I found from one of my own patients was actually sickle cell. And uh, in sickle cell patients, when they have a, a sickle crisis, as you know, they can form clumps of the uh, abnormal red cells, and that can actually occlude and stenose the stent. And you see here, the treatment for those can be as simple as an exchange transfusion. This is pre and post exchange transfusion. Uh, you can see that the, the stenosis has significantly improved. Um, what about the PECOM artery uh, and the posterior paraclinoid aneurysms? Uh, but we found in our series that uh, the aneurysms that are fetal PECOM uh, have a 100% patency in follow-up following flow diversion. And here's an example, pre and post flow diversion, you see not only the aneurysm continues to fill at six months. Now you have a bigger problem because you have to still treat the patient with microsurgical clipping. You have to stop the aspirin and increase the risk of perioperative stroke. So in our series, every fetal PECOM aneurysm um, will either get clipped or treated by another way uh, and not by linear flow diversion. A single device uh, has, is sufficient for treatment of all these aneurysms. Um, we also have the POPS original trial, now has a five-year follow-up that was published two years ago. And what they found was what happens with the remainder 15%, we said overall occlusion of about 87%. What happens to the remainder of those patients? Do they need to be retreated? And the answer is no. If you just sit tight and wait, the aneurysm occlusion doesn't stop. And the uh, occlusion is progressively increased over time. They looked at uh, one, three, and five years in this multi-center trial and found that it increased uh, progressively to nearly 96%. Uh, so uh, long-term, and they study also very safe, 96.5% of patients had excellent modified ranking scores. So this all led to the expansion of the original FDA approval indications to include aneurysms all the way to the carotid terminus. Um, uh, there's been second and third generation devices now uh, for the pipeline device. We're now in a third generation device. And uh, similar to the FDA here, luckily we're expanding our indications. Um, this is a patient that came to me for a second opinion, uh, has uh, dysplastic pica mid-segment aneurysm with a Murphy's excrescence, partially fusiform with some inflow stenosis and uh, with a single stent shown here. On the pica only, we have a nice aneurysm occlusion uh, at one month follow-up. This is another patient with a large partially thrombosed uh, right MCA aneurysm. Uh, we've all treated these open and uh, they can be quite challenging cases. And uh, this is with a single stent. You can see complete aneurysm occlusion and six month follow-up. Uh, some more complex cases. We have now uh, treating uh, inflow aneurysms to this uh, posterior occipital AVM. Uh, you can see the uh, irregular aneurysms at the basilar apex and proximal P1. As we know, these have a higher propensity to rupture. Uh, with a single stent device, you can see a six-month follow-up, complete aneurysm occlusion, and uh, nice protection of, uh, of these inflow lesions. And then we went on to treat the AVM. Uh, other areas where we've pushed the envelope is treating fenestrated aneurysms. These are very challenging cases. And we've published our series, although limited, um, uh, we've treated close to uh, 10 patients now. Most of them tend to be in the basilar trunk. Um, and the treatment here is to uh, flow divert the dominant limb of the fenestration and coil deconstruct the non-dominant limb. And you can see here, excellent long-term follow-up. Uh, some other cases can be more complex. This is a patient that was transferred with a, a breakage in the construct. And uh, we can actually navigate carefully through the devices and bridge uh, the breakage and salvage the stent. Uh, you can, if you have to do bilateral uh, flow diversion, we don't recommend you do them up front. This is a young uh, uh, nurse who had bilateral large ophthalmic artery aneurysms and uh, was treated on one side successfully, waited a few months, make sure that the uh, 
treated side doesn't have severe uh, stenosis at the stent, and then uh, went on to uh, treat the contralateral side, as you see on the right, uh, with excellent six-month follow-up. Uh, what's new in uh, linear flow diversion? We have new devices. This is a pipeline shield device uh, that have actually uh, external coating that uh, decrease the risk of thromboembolic events because it mimics the outer membrane of the red blood cells. Several trials are investigating uh, whether we need to use dual antiplatelet therapy for these flow diverters or not. This is the surplus device, very similar to uh, the pipeline device. Um, a new device that uh, seems to be exciting is the FRED device by Microvention, uh, gained FDA approval two years ago. And uh, this stent is a little bit different because the proximal and distal tines of the stent have non-flow diverting segments. And uh, this can be very important when you treat aneurysms that are close to a bifurcation, as you see here, uh, this PECOM artery aneurysm that recurred following subarachnoid hemorrhage we were able to treat it and land the flow, non-flow diverting segment at the carotid terminus, therefore not jailing the A1 and potentially causing ischemic side effects from that. Uh, here's again another example of the non-flow diverting segment ending in the carotid terminus. Uh, this is a deployment example of the same aneurysm, very easy to deploy, almost like a self-expandable stent. And uh, um, naturally we went on to do many cases with this new device. And you can see here, this in the middle is immediate stasis following a single stent in the ophthalmic segment. We call that the eclipse sign, which is a great prognostic indicator of complete aneurysm occlusion on follow-up. These are some other cases, a posterior paraclinoid, uh, ophthalmic aneurysm, and a superior hypophyseal artery aneurysm. A lot of times these devices are resheathable up to three times. If you don't like the original deployment, you can resheath and uh, redeploy. And uh, these are some more challenging aneurysms. This is a patient uh, 60 years old with a history of left craniotomy for clipping of an MCA aneurysm. Uh, came with uh, increasing headaches and right-sided paresthesias. And you can see here on the MRI, he has a large recurrence of his MCA, partially thrombosed. You can see part of it is filling, but the greatest majority of it is actually not. And this is the MRA. And you can see here to the right on the 3D reconstruction, the steel from this giant aneurysm, it doesn't capture the entire filling of the aneurysm. Here's the part that's filling on the left side on the source data. And this is the angiogram. One of the real challenges of this case is not just the fusiform segment, but you can see the aneurysm fills in different uh, uh, phases of the angiography. You can see the inflow in the early arterial phase and the outflow in the late venous phase. And this leads to a dominant M3 on the dominant hemisphere, certainly not an artery that you would want to um, deconstruct and sacrifice. This is again, the, the same case. And this is high magnification to add more to uh, the uh, challenge. You can see inflow severe stenosis uh, uh, leading into the aneurysm. Obviously, um, this is a high risk case with open uh, vascular uh, because of the previous craniotomy, the giant size um, and all those um, angiographic uh, factors I showed you. So we chose to build a flow diverting construct and oftentimes exiting a giant aneurysm is probably the most challenging part of your case, as you see here. And uh, this is building a flow diversion construct. Uh, here I use the FRED device. And um, you have to be very cautious not to exert a lot of tension into the system because you can uh, herniate the whole construct uh, into the giant aneurysm with catastrophic consequences. This is landing uh, uh, perfectly right at the area of the stenosis. The reason I chose the thread, you can see here on the right, I was able to land the non-flow diverting segment into that stenotic area uh, to decrease the likelihood of the uh, aneurysm and the, um, the M2 occluding. And this is the angiogram following deployment. This is the construct of the six stents. Uh, this is a short-term follow-up angiogram. The patient's neurologically intact. 
and uh, doing very well. What's new in linear flow diversion? We have uh, smaller devices. This is a Fred Jr. that allows you to navigate uh, very distally. This is treatment of a previously ruptured and recurred pericolosal artery aneurysm. And there's a, a new generation Fred uh, device coming up as well in the month. However, uh, we have now changed flow diversion and we now have uh, endosacular flow diversion where we deploy a single device within the aneurysm sac. And this is uh, indicated for carotid terminus artery aneurysms and bifurcation aneurysms in general. Um, this is the, the papers that led to the safety and efficacy and FDA approval of the device. Uh, these are some of our cases that we uh, publish in these papers. Uh, you can see here really nicely uh, an ACOM artery aneurysm with great follow-up. Uh, similarly, MCA, complete aneurysm occlusion at six months and the only remnant of the aneurysm are the proximal and distal tines of the web. This is another MCA artery aneurysm and this is a basilar apex. So FDA approval for these endosacular devices is uh, almost two years now. Uh, like any device sizing is very important and it's key for correct deployment. Um, in the middle, you have the correct deployment. If you compress the device and exert too much tension, you're going to leave a remnant at the neck. And also you have a higher risk of rupturing the aneurysm. If you have too much tension um, uh, here, uh, you'll see that you run a higher risk of occluding the bifurcation and uh, causing later ischemic events. Uh, we've published our initial 64 aneurysm experience with great results. And uh, we also published our a treatment of subarachnoid hemorrhages uh, with the web. It actually tends to be my uh, device of choice for wide neck aneurysms uh, um, and uh, is a nice complement to microsurgical clipping when appropriate. What's the advantage in subarachnoid hemorrhage? You don't need to use dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, just aspirin if, uh, and, and sometimes you don't even have to use aspirin. This is an example of a basilar apex artery ruptured aneurysm and this is not at six months follow-up. This is immediately following aneurysm uh, treatment on the table. You have complete aneurysm occlusion with a single device. This is uh, uh, another complex aneurysm. This is an ACOM aneurysm, multi-lobed. And you can see here, immediate aneurysm occlusion with a single device. Uh, when the aneurysm is irregular, such as the previous ACOM, you see here a Murphy's excrescence uh, approximately. Uh, you don't have to fit the whole device in the aneurysm because oftentimes you can occlude an excrescence by secondary intent as it's really nicely depicted here. As always, new technology has new caution. You see here sometimes when uh, uh, the device uh, uh, comes up, uh, the whole microcatheter uh, can lead into the dome and cause a rupture. So you have to, uh, as always, use very caution, especially in your first few aneurysms. Um, and uh, we push the envelope. These are some complex aneurysms. This is a uh, bilobed ACOM uh, with superior and inferior projections that was treated with two distinct webs. And this is uh, post uh, deployment of the web. Again, this is now the web stasis, which is the new eclipse sign. And uh, as always, uh, Jefferson, we're pushing the envelope and the limits. We're treating sidewall aneurysms. This is a fetal PCOM. Uh, obviously, more caution needs to be used here because you have uh, an additional angle um, when you're deploying the device and you just have to be very comfortable with uh, bifurcation aneurysms before uh, doing something like this. This is deployment of the web device. This is detachment of the device. And this is, uh, you can see here, nice stasis uh, within the aneurysm web. Again, very great progressive indicator. This is an ophthalmic artery aneurysm that I didn't want to use a flow diversion uh, in, the his in the setting of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And with the single web device that you see here, uh, you can see near complete immediate aneurysm occlusion. Uh, this is actually just from yesterday's cases. This is an irregular basilar apex artery aneurysm. Um, again, similarly, uh, secondary intent of closure of the Murphy's expressance with a single device. And uh, you can see nice stasis within the aneurysm immediate following deployment. And uh, this next case is uh, a, a M1 artery aneurysm. You can see an, a lenticular striate coming off of the aneurysm. Obviously, um, this could very well be uh, treated with microsurgical clipping. Uh, the patient opted for endovascular treatment 
And you can see here, once we deploy the device, we're actually able to contour the device within the sac. And you can see here by exerting a little tension <clears throat> in theory at the pole, I was able to allow filling and uh, distort the device at the takeoff of the lenticular striate to be able to uh, preserve flow in that artery. Uh, Web 17 is new and exciting. Uh, it's a much smaller device, 17, meaning the microcatheter requiring to, uh, to navigate uh, into the vessels, which is the smallest one we have. And this is a, <clears throat> and a patient that was treated at a very distal M2, M3 junction aneurysm. And uh, this uh, uh, was treated with a single device uh, with excellent aneurysm occlusion. And you can see here the secondary Murphy's expressions obliteration. Uh, Jacques, we do love to operate and uh, we do have some great cases for recurrences and some great videos. This is a recurrent PCOM artery aneurysm that was treated with the web. And uh, although these devices can adhere to uh, adjacent cortex and tissue, um, they're actually very easily compressible and uh, the clip will actually collapse the device, as you see here. Uh, what's new in the horizon? Contour is a device that's coming to us by Cirrus from Europe. Like any of these devices, it has, it has already been CE mark approved in Europe. Uh, this is the study that um, um, uh, shows efficacy and safety of the device. And it's a web minus the dome. So technically, we may have an advantage in decreasing um, uh, uh, risk of rupture, not having that uh, second half of the dome of the device and also being able to treat more shallow aneurysms. We have our first contour case coming up on Monday. Um, and uh, I promise you, I'll show you that from the INR, we can now go and treat the patient from home. Uh, robotics and surgery, general surgery has been used since the 1990s. And finally, it's coming into the endovascular uh, world. Uh, Corpath uh, Corindus has uh, 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 the robot that's been CE marked approved in January of 2018 and FDA approved a few months thereafter, only for uh, peripheral cases, which means uh, we have studied it here for carotid stenting and uh, it's pending FDA approval for intracranial. Uh, this is completely new and different. You have a two physician team, ultimately the physician who runs the robot, that's me here, that's my fellow at the bedside, uh, could potentially be home with remote robotics. And, uh, now, this is literally uh, using joysticks and uh, uh, navigating devices uh, with minimizing radiation exposure, not adding additional radiation exposure to the patient. So these are the great advantages of the robot. Uh, they have already performed remote robotics for treatment of uh, acute coronary uh, uh, syndrome in India where the operator was 20 miles away, uh, uh, treating with balloon angioplasty and stent. And in Canada, uh, that are now limited by the FDA, um, uh, Vitor Pareto and his colleagues are actually using it for uh, endovascular treatment, stent-assisted coiling, and I'm sure soon to come flow diversion. So uh, hopefully once we have FDA approver, approval, uh, we'll be potentially performing these procedures remotely in areas that have great need um, and not having to drive into work. So um, I think uh, my time is up. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity and uh, I'll stick around for questions. Thank you, Stav. Uh, what a tour de force. And again, I thank uh, you and Pascal and your group for, of course, pushing the envelope. And then and, and thank God that there are people actually like you who are willing to, to push it, to take the risks and, and produce a, phenomenal volume of scholarship that your center has produced. Um, any, any comments from the panelists on any, on the vast material that Stav has covered? Ali, um, and, and do you like everything Stav has said? Anything, any? I, I, I'm I like Stav very much. <laughs> I'm a big oh, I fan of you like Stav, just the material. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the point is that I have, um, I think it's very, very important to push the edge of a certain field, uh, but it's also very important to 
remain balanced and, and, and without the stops of the world and so forth, fields wouldn't move forward. But these concepts of same day home surgery and, and, and MCA aneurysms with flow diverters, yes, we can show one or two, but I think the balance and, and, and yet another tool being open surgery is, is very important to, to, to talk about. Um, some of those cases, I know you would treat differently. I know I would treat differently. Um, so I, I think as neurosurgeons who do endovascular, um, I think a balanced approach in certain th things is important. Yeah, absolutely, which is why I showed the, uh, the open case. Um, one of the misconceptions is that if you're a dual trained neurosurgeon, you're not an open cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. And similar to what you said, we love open surgery. We love to clip aneurysms. Uh, we're way over 100, 120 cases of clippings every year. But uh, like you said, it's nice to have all the tools and all the skill sets and conform and treat you know, um, the patient based on uh, what's best suited for their anatomy, their age, the rupture presentation, et cetera. Yeah, I'll tell you a, sto a story. I was sitting in the audience with the, the, the Tur Turkish guy, Sekerjay, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. and, not, and a number of our friends were sitting there also. And there was a 16 year old girl with a very large MCA aneurysm that had a flow diverter uh, placed um, and came back with a hemorrhage, which we've all seen. And the conversation was with our own neurosurgeons. And the, the conversation was about, oh, what kind of antiplatelet regimen did you have? What did you think about the VESA? There was no conversation about, hey, <laughs> what about a clip and a, or a clip and a bypass and, and so forth. So I'm afraid that through innovation that the pendulum can, can swing a little too far. Um, so that's, that's sort of my thought. Yeah. Age, like you, you called it exactly a 16 year old uh, with a large aneurysm MCA, you know, definitely open surgery is, uh, should be your number one in the decision-making tree. But Europe in general, I know their open surgery is unfortunately becoming a dying art. There's the endovascular world is very powerful um, and oftentimes uh, uh, led by very prominent interventional radiologists. So uh, that's really uh, portraying exactly the risk you mentioned and you know, the, the lack of balance, unfortunately. Great. Um... Why don't I invite, indeed, Eva Wu, Judy, is the uh, first author of that paper, and uh, she is a rising star. She's our PG3. She, she sleeps and dreams vascular and skull base and microsurgery, and uh, she is going to share a case and get everybody's opinion. Eva, all yours. Do you see my screen, Dr. Morcos? Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the shout out, Dr. Huang. It was uh, really nice of you. And then uh, thank you, Dr. Morcos, for giving me this opportunity to present. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'm a little hoarse. I conveniently you know, lost my voice right before the symposium. But, uh, uh, but yeah, thank you for all the panelists. For all that we research. hear you well. <laughs> and so you know, we chose this case, actually, because we thought it was interesting. There's several different approaches. Uh, for this patient. And so we wanted to get the opinion of the uh, expert panelists. So this is a 43 year old female who actually presented with a syncopal episode and the worst headache of her life. Um, no focal neurological deficits and no relevant past medical history. On CT scan, it showed this uh, diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, eccentric to the right sylvian fissure and then this possible MCA bifurcation aneurysm on the CTA. And so here is the angiogram that was done. And so we wanted to turn it over to our expert panelists now and ask them, you know, number one is how they would describe this aneurysm and number two, um, how they would manage this patient. Stav, how is this patient managed today at Jefferson? And you, you can see the, well, I'm sure you can see the top right. And yeah, sure. So um, what was the Hunt-Hess grade on this patient? It was Hunt-Hess two. Yeah, and the age, sorry. 
43. Yeah. So um, bifurcation aneurysm in the MCA irregular with at least two Murphy's excrescents. Um, you can see in one of the views, you actually have a very small M M3 emanating from one of the aneurysms uh, on the lateral neck of the aneurysm and a very shallow uh, neck. The dome to neck ratio is unfavorable. Uh, this uh, Jefferson only really has one way of being treated and that's microsurgery for clipping. This is not an aneurysm, even in an older patient that you could would consider doing coiling embolization, you see it has a wide neck. <clears throat> you could uh, uh, consider securing the dome, but uh, you, don't, you just don't have enough dome to neck ratio. Uh, similarly, none of these devices uh, that I mentioned earlier would work. We do not do linear flow diversion in, um, in bifurcation aneurysms. So this would never be pipelined or anything like that. So I would clip it. Judy? You may, you may need more than one clip, actually. I'm very happy to hear that uh, because that's exactly what I would have said. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ali? Same, Dr. Morcos. Um, you, you know, there's always been talk about uh, stenting and soul stenting and changing the angle of vessels and whether that obliterates things. But and there are people that would put flow diverters in this, uh, but I, I don't think that's that's the correct thing to do. Okay, Eva, um, what was done on this case? Yeah, so another neurosurgeon actually uh, ended up clipping this aneurysm. So they actually ended up doing on this left side, you can see there's the straight clip that's going across the inferior, uh, inferiorly pointing aneurysm. And then they did a fenestrated clip across the uh, frontal M2 to clip that uh, superiorly pointing aspect. And so a post-op angiogram was done and there was no residual aneurysm. The patient did well post-operatively. However, uh, four weeks later, she actually had a possible fall and hit her head and had, a, had headaches and nausea vomiting came to the emergency room. And so on CT scan, this is what it showed, this hematoma in the surgical cavity um, and next to the clips. And so we did an, another angiogram. And then this is a right uh, lateral ECA injection. Uh, the middle is a, a lateral right ICA injection and then uh, AP um, right ICA injection. You can see this uh, recurrent uh, growth of this MCA bifurcation aneurysm. And so here's the uh, 3D uh, reconstruction and so we wanted to ask the uh, panelists, you know, again, number one, how would you describe this aneurysm? And number two, um, how would you manage this patient? <clears throat> so Ali, why don't you take it up first? What, how do you interpret this case? Uh, I'm sorry. So was there a post-op angiogram that showed yeah. complete obliteration? Yes. yes. Go back to it, Eva. Show them the post-op angio immediately. Uh, it you could not uh, find any residual on this good quality post-op angio. You can see that the surgeon put the fenestrated clip across the M2, and that I think the clip blades touch each other. You know the two clips, uh, yep. and then if if Eva goes to the new angiogram, you will see a separation between the two clips and on that 3D, that bottom, yeah, you, you see like a toothpaste squeezing of like a, I guess a pseudo aneurysm. That's how, I, what, what, what how, would, is that, would you agree with that interpretation or what's, what would you say? Yes, Dr. Morcos, I mean, uh, was it a dissecting aneurysm? Did this trauma have anything to do with? Uh, the trauma was minor, so. very minor. Yeah. I, I don't know if she fell because of the he second hemorrhage, it was a sure. minor fall at home. We were not impressed by the history. Right. Uh, and there was nothing intraoperatively in terms of coagulating the neck or uh, intraoperative rupture that had to be wrapped or anything like that. It was a straightforward clipping. No, uh, by speaking to the surgeon, the description of the second clip with the fenestration was that it was on a, that thin, the, the one that Stav mentioned, that second tit, the very thin wall, there was barely enough tissue to grab, but he grabbed it. And uh, that was the result. 
Yeah. So whether this is a dissecting a dysplastic vessel that was circumferential, that's probably what caused the regrowth. The question is what to do now. It looks like it's off of one M2 branch. Um, the, the options are to go back in and, and reapply clips and remove and so forth, or to bypass uh, to, to that uh, M2 or even on the surface, figure out which distribution this M2 goes through uh, an SDA MCA bypass and then close, close this off, sacrifice the vessel. I think that's the right way to go. Judy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very good option. I think uh, I would first ask if there, you know, the, the opening, the inflow into this recurrence uh, looks like it's very small and we just confirm that for anybody who does endovascular, that that would not be a good uh, accessible way to, you know, deploy additional coils. Uh, I would assume not because it's not a, it's not a big recurrence and I would, you know, think that it's um, difficult to access. Is that... Do people yeah. agree with that? That it's you know a you know an endovascular coil at this point is not great. Do you have two D? Yeah. Do you have high mag? Uh, the three D is a little hard to see. What's yep. antisage and what's? <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah. I wish we included the actual you know three D rotation. You know. Oh, uh, here, yeah. yeah. The three uh, D rotation. Sorry, there was a, it was just. Oh, here we go. Hard. Yeah. Is that going to help you guys? See, no, we, it's hard to I see needed the neck. A, just a biplane right at the neck to see. By the way, yeah. this is the clips have been subtracted. This is how it is yeah. without the clips. I mean, the general question on a scenario like this, Stav, would you consider endovascular with a very rapid regrowth? We, we have to assume it's at least partially pseudo aneurysmal wall i mean it's impossible so, i totally agree i actually had one of my own cases of ruptured aneurysm it was a blister acom that i clipped similarly intraoperative angiography was negative uh the patient was still in the hospital she did great and three weeks later re-ruptured and very similar to this she had almost three times the size of a dissecting pseudo aneurysm so these are dissecting uh, events and pseudoaneurysm formation, not from the head trauma, but from the trauma of the clip. At one point, and it sounds like, you know, there was an, an issue with one of the M2s, they probably dissected and traumatized enough to create a pseudoaneurysm. So I, I would really love to see the end of the high magnification right um, on the uh, frontal and lateral projection. But in general, and the way I treated my patient, I was actually able to get through that small inflow and occlude the aneurysm, especially if the patient re-ruptures and comes with a higher grade. Um, very important to do a short-term follow-up if you're gonna do that because of the large pseudoaneurysm size. And similarly, intraoperative angiography, even in a very busy place, one thing I learned from that case is if you're really worried about the aneurysm and it's small or has a shallow neck like that one, do a dedicated angiogram the next day. Although the biplane intrap angiogram may show what you think is aneurysm occlusion, you may not be fully occluded and pick up an early pseudoaneurysm. So, uh, but I would try uh, if, if possible to treat this endovascularly as opposed to opening, and I don't know what her hunt a head grade was, but oftentimes these re-ruptures are pretty significant with associated, um, uh, you know, uh, increase in the hunt head scale. She was perfect. On amazing, the re bleed. She was perfect. She also she questioned whether she needs to be in the hospital. She was so good. Yeah. So yeah, I would still try to go endovascular. Sometimes you can actually put a small microcatheter at the inflow and do a micro run and see if you have any outflow M3s or any other arteries. If there are none, I would actually try to secure via an endovascular route. Okay, Eva, tell them what we did. I, you know, I got involved on in this stage and go ahead, Eva. Yeah, we considered you know, all the options that the uh, panelists brought up. We actually ended up deciding on uh, uh, reclipping the aneurysm with a possible bypass. And so here, <clears throat> We isolate the uh, both branches of the STA and SI2 uh, just in case we need the bypass. 
um, we reopen the crany and then extend the craniotomy uh, temporally to allow for more uh, space. And so I'm just going to fast forward through some of this because we're running out of time, but um, we get CSF from the optical carotid cistern to relax the brain. Um, then we obtain um, proximal control. Uh, and then here is um, A1 and M1. Then we obtain um, proximal control at M1. And then here's the, uh, in, the M1 as well again. And then here's where the aneurysm, the fenestrated clip is right here. And then the straight clip is back in this back. And so here um, we evacuate the uh, hematoma through the superior temporal gyrus actually here. And here's the frontal and temporal M2 branches coming into view. So, so if I can interject a little bit, uh, keep playing it, Eva, it's okay. So that fenestrated clip had barely any tissue in it. And I think just yeah. kind of, uh, and you will see in a second where the hole is. The hole is between both clips. Go ahead, Eva, yeah. Okay, let me fast forward a little bit. And so here we're trying to find where the bleeding is coming from. It seems to be coming from, you know, underneath the fenestrated clip. Um, and so we remove the fenestrated clip. Eva, is this a, a regrown aneurysm? Is it a misplaced clip or is yeah, it so a This, this is trauma. actually the pseudoaneurysm sac right here. No, all, Ali, all this tissue, because I watched the previous video, all this tissue is new in four weeks. Yeah. This I'm pushing with my hand. Look look where the hole is. Uh, maybe she'll freeze it. In. It's, it's an interesting teaching case. Once we, there is a temporal M2. We just put the clip on, trapped it because there was good collateral from the temporal M2. And in a second, you'll see the hole. There is a hole. You see it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes. So there is a hole and the question, okay, freeze it here, uh, freeze it here. Can I ask you, Judy, I don't know if you have a good view of what I'm talking about. How would you handle this right now? Yeah. So you see the hole at the bifurcation, very low between temporal and frontal M2s. Reclipping, I cannot put a clip low enough that saves the arteries. Right. What, what tricks? It seems like, so the hole is at the origin of the temporal M2, right? between it's it's at the crutch between temporal and frontal m2 but yes closer to the origin of the uh, temporal m2 yes yeah that, that looks and it looks like a big hole i think you you had prepared for a bypass i think it's very reasonable to do a bypass that i don't see a way to reconstruct that vessel right so i was ready to do the bypass but then what was useful to me there was excellent backflow from the temporal m2 and i said this lady doesn't need her temporal M2. Mm -hmm. uh, Eva, play the, play the video. So I said, oh, and by the way, I, uh, I thought of using the cotton augmentation technique, you know, of, uh, of Dan Barrow and Spetzler of putting a cotton and putting a clip, but even that wouldn't have worked. So I said, I'm going to use the stump of the M2 as a band aid on the hole. So you see, I just cut mm -hmm. the M2 here, mm -hmm. flip it over, you know what I'm saying? And yes. cover the yes. hole and then put the clip across both and it worked like a charm, uh, you know, instead of putting her through. I mean, I could have done the bypass. The STA was ready, but <laughs> it's unnecessary. Um, so, you know, I had never quite done this trick before. So, you know, but... The, uh, the best bypasses are the ones that are not needed. That are not needed, correct. <laughs> How did you assess if it was enough flow? Um, but from your back flow? Well, I had transonic flow probe. Uh, you know, I use it, as you know, quite yeah. a bit. But the vigor of the back, I, we edited the video, but the vigor of the back flow was very good, I, just visually, to be honest with you. And then look at the ICG, the, it, in a temporal lobe fills. Um, the the, the shorter way would have been, of course, to do a bypass, but, you know, I felt 
Jacques, if I may uh, add, the endovascular equivalent of what you did by observation um, in, in the temporal M2 <clears throat> would be if you were to place a microcatheter into the aneurysm <clears throat> and see that you know the temporal M2 was coming off right at the area where you had the trauma, you can do provocative testing. So you can do <clears throat> intra-arterial lidocaine and brevital and test the vessel as if you were to deconstruct it. So let's say you coil the aneurysm and the, uh, the area of injury and your M2 shuts down. Sometimes it may, sometimes it may not. <clears throat> if the patient passes provocative testing, then <clears throat> you could have treated uh, minimally invasive as well. But Stavri, I mean, I know you know that uh, <clears throat> provocative testing is not an exact replica of sacrificing the origin of the vessel, correct? You're showering, you know, the brevital into functioning brain that may be getting collaterals from the PCA. You know what I'm saying? Collat if so you have to be just within that vessel. If you say, let, if you see collateralization, obviously it's a false pass. Right. And uh, there's also a 20% false pass in every provocative test, uh, which unfortunately it's not a hundred percent proof. Right. That right. would be the endovascular equivalent of, of what you observe. But I mean, seeing this whole, I, 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 would, I would think endovascularly would be very tenuous, but I don't know, you know. Um, so anyway, did, she did perfectly. Great case. Fine. Yeah, interesting, huh? The, the, these holes, little things. Eva, was there anything else? You, yeah, that's no, a post-op. This is a post-op imaging. No. I think the equivalent of, of this is the, the times for dissecting aneurysms, uh, the things that seem to work are flow diverters. So if you were right. going to sacrifice it anyway, maybe, maybe that's the treatment where you put a flow diverter in the, in the healthy vessel. Well, you know, we discussed it, of course, as a team with, with my endovascular partners. And, and, you know, no, I mean, they, they agreed that surgery is the way, you know, they did not want to try endovascular, uh, at least at our place. Um, okay. Uh, and then maybe a quick case that David, uh, my, our current fellow, can present, uh, get your opinion, and then I'll let everybody go and enjoy the evening. Sure. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Morcos, and it's an honor to be able to present an um, accomplished panelist today. So this is a challenging case that we saw in clinic earlier in the week. 18-year-old uh, with an acute onset headache, vomiting, neck stiffness uh, last month that resolved after a week. Uh, she visited the emergency room and was sent home um, and then saw an outpatient neurologist who obtained an MRI. Um, and her exam, she's neurologically intact. Here's her MRI performed as an outpatient. And you can see this midline vascular lesion and associated potential aneurysm here. So an AVM with a, a perinatal intranatal aneurysm is the presumed diagnosis at this point, and uh, she subsequently underwent um, an angiogram. Left and right ICA injections and. You can see the aneurysmal formation. Uh, Dr. Morcos had some, some thoughts on the exact diagnosis and, and how to classify that, um, that aneurysm. But I'll, I'll turn it over to the panelists to discuss what their thoughts are on, on uh, management at this point. So, so if I, thanks, David. If I can add, it, I was pretty, conv I just saw her a few days ago. I was pretty convinced she had a small bleed on November 7, and you know nobody picked up on it where, where she went. It, uh, she had even neck stiffness for about six days and then recovered. Still has, interestingly, some nausea. Uh, no, no, keep your slides on. I'm sure you're gonna go back, David, to some of the images. Um, uh, Judy, you gave us a spectacular analysis of AVMs. Mm -hmm. 
just describe to us, you know, how, what you see, how you interpret her risks. Uh, yeah, yeah. What is it? What kind of AVM is it? What's yeah. this? Two right. I, this is this is very challenging. This is <laughs> even though it's small, it's exclusively deep. Um, you know, the uh, ACA feeders, you know, look like they're incredibly small uh, vessels. Um, there's no, I don't see a major, you know, uh, right. branch, right. you know, and it's um, the only good thing about it is that the nidus is pretty compact, I think, <laughs> and, and instead of diffuse, that's the only favorable thing about it. Um, the, the outflow is very interesting to me. There does look like venous um, uh, stenosis outflow, and then that, that, uh, sort of uh, um, the hang up of the the stasis in the outflow. Yes, is is very bizarre. So um, I, this is not a good case for microsurgical resection in my mind. Um, I think it's very hard to to reach. It's a long reach. Um, you know, I was thinking about you know if you were to do interhemispheric or something like that, but that looks very challenging. So I do think um, you know I'll defer to the others for endovascular, but I think it's something that's more suitable for radio surgery. And uh, I would say, do you, did you do any Dyna CT images to try to get axial imaging um, for, you know, sort of targeting? That's, that's what I would, we would do here. Uh, you're not, you're not worried that uh, radio surgery will be a two to three year wait? I am. I am totally worried. Yeah, no, I think it's, but, but I, I, yeah, no, it's not not great. She doesn't have good options. Stav, can you show the MRI again, real quick, please? <clears throat> if you can show me the nidus and the MRI. Uh, by the way, you can see two circular things on the axial MRI. The, the, what I think is a venous varix, but also a trapped frontal horn. It's white on CSF. The left frontal horn, interestingly, it's trapped uh, here on that bottom right. There, you see that? CSF, mm -hmm. interesting. So it's yeah. blocking foramen of Monroe on, I'm sorry, on the left, I mean. Yeah, then, so if you go back to the angiogram, the nidus, uh, like Judy said, it's, it's racemic. So there's really no good arterial feeders. This is not an endovascular candidate. Uh, the slow filling aneurysm, it's a venous aneurysm. So um, it looks like most of those feeders on the MRI are actually relatively anterior and less steep than the outflow. Uh, Radio surgery, like Judy said, it's a great option, but if there is a history of hemorrhage with which Jacques, um, I think you said you think she had a sentinel headache. Yeah, more than, I mean, she had neck stiffness for six days and nobody did a scan. Uh, it yeah. sounds like a small bleed, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, microsurgery would actually be her best option uh, and at least attempt to do a, a nidus resection and skeletonize uh, and remove that uh, the nidus. Obviously, hopefully the venous aneurysm, once you occlude the nidus, we just go on to regress and you won't have to worry about placing a ventric or a shunt. Uh, but uh, yeah, minimally invasive options, not great here. Uh, I guess, I, you know, you're right, you could come, you could come subfrontal. Um, I think that there's a little risk. I worried initially about the risk of residual. Um, yeah. You know, so there seems to be, it, it is, it crosses the midline, you know, there's these um, wispy vessels that are further out. Um, and obviously oh, by, by frontal, by hemispheric injury, but I think the alternative, mm -hmm. um, it would be two very long years to wait on this. So Stav and Ali, our good friend, Henry Wu is, is in the audience and he wrote, besides wishing me happy birthday, which is my birthday today, he suggested um, a transvenous embolization pressure cooker. What do you guys think, you, you, you guys who do this, what do you think of that? the patient will become a pressure cooker afterwards. Um, I, I, I think, I, I think that I, I'm sorry, stop, go, go ahead. I didn't. No, go ahead. Ellie. Please. After so, you. Yeah. The issue here with the pressure cooker and for the non endovascular uh, folks in the, the audience, 
Um, it's, it's basically uh, described a lot in the European literature. Rene Chapeau is a very famous interventional radiologist that started it, but it's basically occluding the aneurysm via transvenous route uh, while shutting down arterial inflow uh, and controlling the aneurysm uh, that way. It works well with deep AVMs such as this one and with AVMs that have a single venous outflow such as this one. Uh, my concern for that is a, um, you know, the large venous ectasia there, whether you would be at a higher risk of rupture navigating through that. B, there's venous outflow stenosis that we saw in the dynamic run. And C, uh, whether we would be able to actually uh, uh, flow a rest. I'm not sure we have large enough feeding arteries to be um, able to safely i don't have the contralateral injection i agree with you they're small it's like yeah, a... so i would be very hesitant to um you know to flow a rest from the arterial side so you can do the pressure cooker from the venous side great suggestion though because of the deep uh, location and the single venous outflow but i would be um very hesitant to do it and um again like we said uh microsurgery option is still there. Well, that's what I offered her. And I offered her a super selective angiogram just, just to understand the nidus better. Mm -hmm. But she is getting a couple more opinions. And obviously, I just saw her this week. So I thought it's an interesting one for conversation. Uh, I think there would be a utility in repeating the angiogram in a delayed fashion. You know, after she resolves her hemorrhage, I think there's a possibility that you'll see more vessels that you're not seeing now. And uh, you know that might uh, inform the microsurgical approach. The, is there a hematoma, Jacques? At the... no, no, there is no okay. hematoma. No, there's no hematoma, Judy. It's, it's is, a small subarachnoid. That was all the. Is it in the hypothalamus or in the fornices from the MRI? It's really the anterior perforator substance. It's not a fantastic area to operate, but that's yeah. where anterior perforator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this concept of venous occlusion is not a new concept, as you all know, it was initially described by Sean Mullen, who, who was a surgeon, would measure the venous pressures, take down arterial feeders until, and then close that off. I think without really understanding the hemodynamics, um, to, take a, to take that type of approach, I think renders a, a lot of hem, hemorrhagic risk. So for me, depending on the eloquence of where this actually is, it's either a surgical case in good hands or a radi radio surgery case in mediocre hands. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to cut you guys short because I have to leave. <laughs> um, Happy birthday, Jack. Thank you so much. I cannot say, this is, this is a fantastic session. Of course, I have excellent taste in choosing my speakers and here is the proof. Thank you all. Lovely to see everybody. Thank you for the audience, uh, to the audience for sticking with us and uh, happy new year to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy, happy holidays. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.